Now, Ryan Adams, can you remember that moment when you heard music and you were captivated? What was it? You know, um, that's such an interesting question that no one ever asks me that or, or, or has. I love music because my grandmother loved it. She loved it so much. In fact, it's the, it's the safe place I remember. It's the first place I remember. She had a big, black, amazing, Batmobile-looking fury. Um, and she would listen to the oldie station. And she used to do this thing. Uh, I was just a kid, you know, maybe five, six years old, whatever my earliest memories can be. Um, and she would always be listening to the radio and she would say like, do you like this song or do you want to listen to their station? And instead of turning the dial, she would press the button because it was, you know, it was the old, big old fury. So she could press the button and go click and it would go over to the next station. And basically there were the two oldie stations, so whatever. And there'd be a cake beside her and a blanket or something. We'd be on the way for her to drop off stuff at her church because she made quilts and baked cakes for people in need that she didn't know. That was her thing. And she would do this thing when we were at a, at a stoplight where if a song was on, she, she didn't really sing very much and she didn't play the instruments, but she would go to the, to the drums of a song. And you loved her? So much, yeah. And so, the, so music, as I grew up, like it just, she was always listening to something and I think it reminds me of, 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 of being safe. That song, Oh My Sweet Carolina, sounds like it could have been dedicated to her. Is that true? It's absolutely about her, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting thing to be from uh, a place like where I'm from because it's uh, basically, it's not a beachfront town. It's not close enough. But it's just far enough away to where, you know, um, there's a river that kind of dries up about the middle of the town that I'm from. And, uh, and there's that... You could smell salt in the air, but you're not at the beach yet. And it's far enough away from the center of the, of the state that things are pretty slow. It's economically kind of depressed. Um, you know, there's an, still enough salt in the air that like most of the houses, you, know, you can paint them as much as you want. It's just gonna, it's just gonna eat, eat away at the paint. Things rust a lot quicker than you'd expect. And uh, it's very kind of, um, there's a real, desperate loneliness, I think, in that place. And the older I became, the more I was aware of what that that ominous presence that I couldn't name was. And it, I, think it, I think it was that. Yeah. So for better or for worse in your career, and I want to, I'll ask you about better and worse in a minute, but when you made the album Heartbreaker, you seemed to tap into that strain of those memories in that place. Can you tell us how the album came to happen, because it, it seems to have quite an extraordinary origin that allowed you to tap into that, his, your own history. Mm. Well, I, I had been, I had been in a band before then, um, this band Whiskey Town, that more or less was like an art project. It was just some people getting together to make music. The intention was never to be anything more than what we were. Um, and the tension was sort of, thrust at the band in a way that I didn't, couldn't have expected, um, definitely at a time that I wasn't prepared, and then strangely for a thing that didn't feel truly like it was mine. So it was a really weird place to be. It was almost like saying like, um, it, 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 it would almost be like you're preparing or getting ready in your life to, to become this thing that you wanted to become, and before you could even get there, someone's like, and you're just doing something like an exercise to, to on your way. Someone's like, "Here's your chance," and you're like, "No, this isn't what I do." Like, <laughs> and what do you do in that situation? And uh, and for me, it was fail miserably. That's what I did. And you feel that? Well, yeah. I mean, I, a lot of it I think was intentional. I knew that it wasn't the right thing, and mm -hmm. and and I think everyone else in the band, however many people there were in that band, which was a lot. Um, 
like we all kind of didn't know how to really even be musicians or play those songs yet. You know. But uh, that's going along, and suddenly in your life, mm. relationship breaks up, you've got no money, mm. you sort of got to get out of New York, mm. and you have to make a big decision about your future, and you make this record. Well, it was very humbling to, uh, I, didn't, I didn't even have enough money to fly home or take a train, a friend had to come pick me up. Um, and I remember actually getting in the, in the van, my, my buddy's van, and uh, we're driving away from New York City, and I'm like looking out the back, like looking through the rearview mirror, and like looking out the back windows, and as we're and I'm seeing it get smaller and smaller, and I'm like, man, I'm like going back to North Carolina, like, like that's over, like all that great stuff. Like, but something great, presented itself. Yeah, like a heavy dose of depression <laughs> and copious really? amounts of alcohol. <laughs> Like, and, you know, I, I really retreated back. Uh, I mean, I first went to Raleigh, North Carolina. I went back to where, um, you know, I went back to where Whiskey Town um, had, had been a band. And, and some of my friends were still there. And I realized that I'm like, I can't really come back here. Didn't feel right to me. So I actually moved all the way back to my hometown, to Jacksonville. And I moved back in with my friend Alan, whose backyard actually the fence of his backyard touched the fence of my grandmother's backyard, hilariously. So I just moved back in with him and um, and recorded on the same four track that I'd recorded my first recordings on when I was 16, 17 years old. And I just figured it was done. I was looking for a construction job. I didn't have a manager. I didn't know um, anyone or anything was happening and I just kind of sort of expected it was like okay I'm gonna be this guy that I'm gonna you know I'll play at a bar or cafe or something sometimes and I'll just write some songs and this is like this is gonna be who, who I am and uh, and so I I think I was kind of writing the uh, it's like I was sort of writing a from a place so distant from a anything attached to what my hopes and dreams, the vehicle of my hopes and dreams as an, a, a, an aspiring musician that made records, these songs were something very different. They weren't like an epilogue, but they were further than that. Mm. They were maybe like, you know, commentary on an epilogue. They, they, were, they were something entirely different. But yeah. you tapped into something that people just got at some gut level. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was it? Well, maybe it was, uh, I think I was raw. I think I, think I didn't have anything to lose. Right. So I think that, um, I mean, it's tough being a human being, isn't it? It's tough being in these meat vehicles and seeing all this madness, all these people so angry, so many people are so fragile, watching people pass away, watching people who maybe you don't think they sh deservedly so rise up around you or feeling your uh, own sense of mortality or time or um, there's a, you know, it's like for every day there's like a new level of innocence in your own spirit to break, <laughs> right? And like on that journey, on that path, if you can allow yourself to break enough, you might become just quiet enough and just humble enough to really see, you know, who who you are, like, and just how small you are, and, and what's really happening. And I think that um, I was lucky enough that I didn't have to actually, I didn't have to discipline myself to be that way in that moment, the world broke me. I was in the right place at the right time and the world just, I just got right in its way and it, it just crunched me. And I just was like, wow. But in a good way, in a well, good way. Well, yeah, absolutely, because um, there's nothing like taking somebody that, you know, is wanting things for the wrong reasons or, uh, or maybe has potential to write more from who they really are or see 
the na true nature of their own existence or their place in the world, and but maybe being distracted from that. Um, how lucky was I to be able to get humbled like that, to get set back like that, so that I didn't, I mean, imagine if, uh, I, I would say it like this, like I, I couldn't think of anything worse than if Whiskey Town had, had like a, like if we had a platinum album, or if I'd had a number one song, what kind of monster would I have been? Or, or worse, like who would I be now? If I had attained all these things that I thought that I wanted then, what would I have done with them? I, I don't even, I, I can't even imagine like the awfulness that would have happened from, um, for, for, from that. It would have mm. been, it would have been a, it would have been a terrible tragedy, but the universe was kind to me and it saw me like foolishly without reason reaching for something that wasn't mine and it smacked my hand as hard as it could. And I, and I, I woke up, you know, and then it was nice. I, I woke up and I retreated and, and I got back to what I was supposed to be doing and I have mostly done since then, mm. which is I put my ass in the seat and I open up the book and I, and I write what's on my mind. Mm. And that's between me and that page. And nothing else gets in the way of it. And whatever happens after that, it's none of my business. I can comment on it. I can become part of it. I can let it go. But that other part, that's always just been me and that page. That's that's a sacred time, and I learned that lesson. I think from that, it was it was a it was it was. I am very fortunate that that happened. Mm. So, in in some senses, that changed your life, as you've just said, in in so many ways. You know, philosophically, emotionally, in a practical sense too. But it, it seemed to me that that after making two big records. You, you, a lot of people started to try and corral you and say, well, you're this or you're that. And there's an instinctive thing I observe in you that you say, I'm not going to be buttonhole, pigeonhole, I'm not going to be pushed into that frame. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes, I am a Scorpio. <laughs> and what does that mean? It means I'm a bastard. <laughs> it means like, I, I don't like, uh, you know, like someone says like, these are the lines you color in, and I just start coloring on the outside of them. I don't know. It's that instinctive. Yeah, I mean, at least artistically, I think. I mean, I think that. Um, I think it's an interesting thing. I, I, I know at the time that I was doing what I was doing, in the beginning of my solo career, um, that I really was just following a thread of songs that I really mm -hmm. thought mattered. Mm -hmm. I, I initially wanted to make a record that would have been my first or my second solo record. Mm. But um, I recorded it and it was just me on an acoustic guitar and some strings and once in a while a stand-up bass player because I had fallen in love with the um, unreleased version of Blood on the Tracks called Blood on the Tapes, which is a really mystical version of that Bob Dylan record where instead of being so angry, which of course he was going to become angry, in this version he's destroyed. He is completely screwed, and you know it, he knows it, and he's smart, but he's only barely smart enough to keep, it, keep up with just how, just how in pain he is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's interesting listening to somebody that is such an intellectual, artistic giant, um, not being able to catch up with their karma, and, and he's writing about that. Mm -hmm. But I suppose it didn't come out for a couple of reasons. Reading about rock history and things like that is one is because he must have been wearing a a, a, a button-up shirt or a shirt that had like a button that was touching the acoustic guitar and rattling it. And then and also his manager happened to be um, the brother of the woman of whom he was writing about splitting up with. So of course they were like, well, maybe you shouldn't release the, these songs. But it, I had become obsessed with that record. And I suppose that the things I wrote about on Heartbreaker, I was processing them in a different way after a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. And I made this uh, recording, and, um, and I thought that it should be the record. And, and I, I, I handed it to the people that I was working with at the time, and they said, this is career suicide. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's a great name for this record. <laughs> it's like the career suicide handbook. And I thought that would be my record. And then, of course, you know, some time passes, and I ended up making the record I did. And 
Um, Made you even more famous. I guess. I mean, I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know if I. I don't know if I resonate with fame because it doesn't really. It doesn't. I don't know how to. I don't know how to stick to it. Mm. I don't know what it is. And definitely at that time, whatever fame is or however that works, it definitely didn't apply to me, and I still don't think it does because things changed at that time. When I made gold, so much changed for musicians. I mean, I, it, in America, not only did the fact that you know we had such a huge thing like 9-11 happen and then things became very different and, mm -hmm. and, and, and very compressed for, for us, you know, and for the news and for who people were. But also, um, uh, in the next few years, most records, instead of you passing along a cassette tape to your buddy and putting it in your car and it's a great mixtape, most records and things were starting to get file shared. Mm. And I didn't have a, a computer then, so I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. I didn't know how that worked. But I think that you could be listened to it in a much more vast way then maybe you could be, then you could keep track of. Yeah. So, um, so I, I kind of, um, I think I, I think whatever I was becoming and whatever the idea was, sort of got lost in that shuffle, and hmm. um, and rightly so. And 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 so in that sense, just moving on in in that period. It seems to me you discovered another element of yourself, and maybe you knew about it all along, but you sang a song by Oasis called Wonderwall, mm. and you made it your own. You found that you could interpret, it seemed to me, and what was it about that song that grabbed you? I was engaged to this songwriter, um, very beautiful, very smart, very funny, awesome person. And uh, our relationship fell apart because um, many reasons, but one of the reasons was uh, she lived in London predominantly, and I lived in New York. And I loved being in London, and I would spend as much time as I could there with her, and, and I just really loved it. But we were, essentially were living with her mother on the second floor of her mom's flat. And then in New York, I had my own place. So doing that trip back and forth just didn't ever make sense to the long term to our relationship. And then um, I became, you know, very lost and 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 I think more more depressed than, than, uh, than I had ever really been about that, because I I really wanted that to work, and I was in this phase of my life where I was really wanting to cling to something and find something to, you know, I wanted to put who I was in some kind of resin, like one of those beetles that you see that people put in resin to make a belt buckle out of it. I wanted to do that to my feelings. I wanted stability of some sort, and I wanted to encapsulate what love I had, and, and I couldn't do it. And so I, for the first time, really embraced just getting marvelously high all the time, or as much as possible, and going as far out as I could to try to escape the pain of things. And, and I had all these psychedelic experiences where I really could see my own self above myself and really was sort of having a very transcendental time that was separate from taking drugs, but also it was part of that as well. And, and of course, my songs went haywire and, and eventually became that record, Love is Hell. But the joke of that song and the irony of it is, although I had played it before then and knew it, um, I, you know, I have always loved Oasis. I always loved what they did for music. I always believed in them and I always got the joke. I always knew that these were, I saw in them what I was. I could see them and I could, I could, I could see in them I was like these are, it's like these kids are, are like kids from down the block. You could tell how they play, and that cockiness that people don't like about them, like, like they're having a laugh, like they're 
because they're having a ball. Like, and, and I got the joviality of it. I, I understood the joke. But and you I, did something else with that song. Totally. So the irony of me recording that song and that record is that record is sort of meant to be this sort of overview of, of that time and how I was losing myself, but kind of like losing myself on purpose. And she loved Blur. Right. So much and was there for the Blur vs. Oasis war. And I knew it would just piss her off so much if I could play the shit out of that song, just play the most ridiculously beautiful, sad, unbelievable version of that song ever. And I remember cutting it. John Porter was at the controls. We were in New Orleans. I'm looking at John Porter. I'm like, you recorded all those Smiths records. I'm looking at him. Greg Lee's like one of the greatest slide players of all time, sitting across me in the room. I've got the acoustic guitar, and I, I remember like going into the beginning of that song, and I just remember thinking like, like I can't wait for you to hear this. <laughs> just then I just let it all out, you know. So it was about loving the song, which at that time I think for a lot of people had become cliche. Mm. I think people had driven past it, and for me I was like, no, it's great. But the other part was for me going like. I really, I was like, I know she's gonna listen to this record and I can't wait for her to go, wait, Wonderfall is on this? And it, it really did make her very mad, which is, which is great. Well, so, I, don't, I don't know if I'm pleased to hear that or not, but-, but, but I mean, <laughs> Mad in a funny way. Like, Fair enough. Yeah. Look, every time that you tell a story about making a record, it's, it's fascinating. And so I probably, in terms of time, should move on. I'm intrigued to know about the gestation of this current album. And, and of course, um, I, I have read about you going for a run, putting certain things on your iPod or oh, yeah. your earphones. W- w- what inspired you? Divorce and running. Divorce and running? <laughs> yeah. I just was running today, actually, amazingly, listening to my, my mix. I have the same iPod Nano that I had when I uh, would when I was running, and I was here, and I um, got engaged. In fact, uh, uh, three days ago, I was running um, in the gardens, mm. and this is so crazy. I'm listening to this mix, and I've been doing this for a long time. It really helps with my Meniere's disease to run, and also just helps in general. It just feels good. Put on the shoes put in the earbuds, you know, put on these short shorts. I look like a dork. I am a dork. Out the door. It's great. Humbling. There I am. Not cool at all. In fact, I'm the opposite of cool, but I'm running. (laughs) So I'm running and I'm, you know, and I was keeping a pretty good pace and, you know, it was kind of gray outside and wasn't the prettiest day and you guys were having some overcast kind of metallic gray clouds and I'm running. And I realize as I look up the hill, I see this bench and I was like, that's the bench I got engaged on. Holy shit. It was so intense. Wow. And I, I'm not, I just kept running, but it was a pretty far piece before I was going to have to pass it. And I didn't know how to process the moment at all, at all. And I'm running. And one of my favorite songs, the song called Words and Days by this unknown band called uh, Jones Very from the, the States was on. And it was one of the first records that I'd ever had. So lots of things are happening to me emotionally, mm-hmm. so much that I don't do anything. And I'm running and I look down and you know how well they keep that park. It's pristine. Mm-hmm. Those walking paths, they're all paved and perfect. And I look down and in pink chalk someone had written in big letters they weren't around i don't know why it was there there was nothing else empathy cursive big letters and i'm just cooking i'm running and i I see it i'm like i just start laughing you know i'm i'm like cooking you know and i i i really just let out this big laugh and then the sun came out just at that exact moment and like the whole park lit up. And then, you know, you see the water, it starts to glisten, and everything kind of made sense. It was like, I remember thinking like, this is why I do what I do. Like, 
this is why I make records, this is why I run, this is, this is why you get up. Because these moments, I could talk about it, I could write a thing about it, but to be in that moment, it, it, there, so, nothing could ever really fully express what that felt like. But, but, you, but you try, don't you? And, yeah. and, and what I'm intrigued about as I listened to the album that, that developed in this running process, um, you talked about ACDC being an influence, and as an Australian I was interested, but as I listened, I had the words of Bruce Springsteen talking about music ringing in my ears, and I thought of the album, the transformative nature of rock and rock music. Mm. And it seems to me that music for you, in, in the way you've just described it, is transformative, isn't it? Um, yeah, absolutely. And And I'm a... Bruce fan that came into the fold later um, because of running. Mm -hmm. I'd never had time to process all of his music, and I'd never had the opportunity to listen to every ACDC record mm -hmm. in a row and go, I want to listen to the entire discography and understand the power of this band. Wow. And running helped me do that because I could go, I'm going to put the first five records on, and then I'm going to put like the second five records on. And I just would, for every day, I would listen to those records. And then my run would get a little bit longer, you know? I mean, you know, I, I remember thinking to myself, it's like, if I've gone for a run and Fly on the Wall isn't done yet, I'm not done yet. Like, I'm listening all the way through. Like, and I, I think that when I was thinking about how I wanted to convey, you, you know, the process of being a songwriter is different than also the process of being Ryan mm. and traveling through time. Uh, but they're becoming parallel more and more because what I want to do is I want to always be myself and I want my songs to always be what they are and I, and I want to reduce what's there. I, I, want to, I, I want to find what's the most pure thing in both of those things and try to reduce it down to the pulp of what that is so I could see it. So for me, some of that means overthinking and then deducing all of that thought. And a great example of, of for me, of something that works, that needs no alteration, that has extreme power, that um, is a force, but you know, a force of good and an overwhelming sense that makes you feel alive is right. ACDC. <laughs> Think about it. Look at any concert from when they're playing. All those people moving at the same time. This band, so unassuming, unbelievable. These are people, you look at them and you go like, these would be people that you would have the best time to sit down and have lunch with them they'd probably like make you laugh 18 times before your food even got there. They're just, they, they're humble and cool. But can I introduce this note? You yeah. said you were going through a divorce. You married that aliveness with the trauma of that for you when I read those lyrics. Uh, haunted House, songs like that, mm. Prisoner. You, you married those two things. How does that happen? Well, I think I think that there's, I mean, I think that there's only really, there's only, there's only really two ways to lose things. You can fight and you can fight that moment and you could learn to, to buy into the aberration of that it belonged to you in the first place and that you've been wronged. You could buy into the resentment. You can create the ghost. Or you could, or you can look at it and you could see it for what it was. You can see how beautiful that is, how much that sucks, how terrible that is, and say like, Man, I, I, I can feel this with every bone in my body. 
it aches, you know? Like, like at any moment I'm gonna, you know, just snap in two, but, it, it, and, on, on I th and then you can let it go. And you could let it go and say, how lucky, how lucky am I to be, you know, to be here to experience this, you know, to, to be part, to be part of this, this thing that. Even the pain? Absolutely the pain, yeah. That's maybe the most important part. I so mean, that's the, that's the part that, um, that's the part where you learn who you are, I think. Ryan Adams, thanks very much for taking the time to talk with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.